Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Uh, now up, uh, also from the Vermont Fish and Wildlife Department, Alyssa Bennett on bat populations. First, I just want to say thank you so much for the invitation to speak here. I was actually a little bit surprised when I got the invitation because when I was looking at the overall theme of what this day was going to be about, I thought, you know, we don't have that much information on the relationship between our bat species in Vermont and what goes on with the forest ecosystem. We know that bats are very important for the forest ecosystem because they're the largest predator of nighttime insects, and a lot of those include insects that can be forest pests. And we also know that bats depend on forests, not only because they roost in trees, but also because they forage in those habitats as well. Um, however, we, again, we don't have a lot of information on that. So what I wanted to talk about was some of the population trends that we're seeing with bats in Vermont over the last several decades, and some trends more recently, and then reflect at the end on some of the big data gaps and what we need to look at to understand better the relationship between bats and this ecosystem. So I just wanted to let you know that we actually have more than one species of bat in Vermont. People often think of bats as being one species, maybe sort of a smallish brownish thing that showed up in your attic when you were going up there to get the Christmas presents out and you were a little surprised to find it there. But we have nine different species, and those can be broken up into two groups. One is the migratory tree bats over on the right, and the other is our cave bats. And we call them that because actually all these species do migrate to some extent. They might travel 50 miles, a couple hundred miles if they're in that cave bat category to go between their summer habitat and where they swarm and breed in the fall and then eventually hibernate in caves and mines. And then the migratory tree bats are uh, the bats that are those long distance flyers. So they tend to fly maybe, if you're a hoary bat, down to the southeastern United States, possibly even down to Central or South America, and they are not here for the winter. We're going to focus on these cave bat species, one because that's where we've seen some big population effects that we've been able to record in Vermont and a lot of the surrounding states, but also because uh, that's where we have the most data. So as you can see, Many, most of these species are listed at the state level, and two of them now are listed at the federal level. And the three in green were all added to our state list, and then the northern long-eared bat to the federal list, all because of white-nose syndrome. Just as a little bit of a history, and to explain that a lot of the work and the data that's here comes from many different sources, work that's been done by our department, but before that it actually started with uh, some folks over at Middlebury College who were going into caves and mines, and then when we started getting on board with doing some of our population surveys, we had a lot of help from the organized caving community who knew a lot of these sites where bats hibernated, Green Mountain National Forest, Army Corps of Engineers, consultants, professors up at UVM, so it's been a very collaborative effort over the years. And then you can see that in 2008 to 10, we were really focused on monitoring what was going on with white nose syndrome. And Right now, we're trying to figure out what do we do with the remnant populations that we have. So again, I'm going to focus on those cave bat species. And finally, there's a new project going on to look at what those trends in populations are for these species on a larger scale, on the continental scale. Because of the migratory nature of these species, they don't recognize state borders. So a lot of the work that we've all been doing to collect information from one state to another hasn't been very comparable, so we're trying to standardize some of those methods so that we can look at some of those trends on a more regional scale and over the distribution of the species. This is just to give you an idea of some of the tools that we use to monitor bats, but I'll be focusing mostly on our high vernacular surveys and then a little bit of um, an overview from what we've seen when we did a reassessment in 2010. So there are a lot of different factors that go into uh, population viability for our bat species in Vermont. Some of the major threats, as I mentioned, white nose syndrome, really the largest one, wind energy development, loss of habitat and connectivity, which we've all been talking about today. Human disturbance is another that I'm going to just touch on because we have some very interesting data. 
uh, biodiversity decline, and that's really where I think there's a big hole in the information. So people often ask when we give presentations on bats, uh, are we seeing a decline, uh, a decline in bats and an increase in mosquitoes, for example? And it's really difficult to find out what that relationship is. So it'd be really interesting to look at, and possibly climate change. Bats themselves have some natural history limitations. They have a very low reproductive rate, high site fatality, so they'll go back to the same tree and roost in it year after year. They live a long time. Some of these species have been recorded up to 34 years old for a little brown bat. And they're vulnerable to certain things, um, disturbance when they're young and can't fly yet, when they're hibernating, and when they're in tor torpor, and we already talked about migration. So if you have any questions about white nose syndrome, come see me later. This is a rich area of research, and there's a lot of cool work that we're collaborating on. But just to give you an idea of what it is, it's a fungal disease. It's psychrophilic, meaning that it's cold loving. So it thrives in the same environment that bats hibernate in. It is an invasive species, as far as we can tell, from Europe, but now research suggests possibly even from Asia. And there's different mor mortality among our different species here. It's very widespread now. You can see it's in over half the US and into Canada. But we do have survivors, and we do see that bats can heal. So when we're looking at some of our select sites, and I want you to keep in mind when you're looking at the bat count over on the left side of the graph, that these are some of our smaller sites. We actually do have some really large sites in Vermont. One of the largest in New England is down in the southwestern part of the state. But some of those larger sites, some of the mines um, that might have uh, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of bats in them, are difficult to survey and possibly dangerous. So we don't have as good long-term data. But if we look at some of the sites that we do have that long-term data on here, you can see that over time, we saw some pretty steady numbers in a lot of these populations. Occasionally, there's a drop like the black line because we just literally didn't have any survey numbers to put in there. But then you can see a very drastic drop off for all of them around 2009, 2010. Some of those sites have flatlined at uh, stable populations, which is good news. And some of them have dropped to zero. And we haven't seen any bats back there again. So that drop right there is, is white nose syndrome. That's when it hit the state. And this is what we were left with. So caves and mines, in some cases, uh, you would see it carpeted with dead bats on the floor of the cave. In a lot of cases, bats would just fly out onto the landscape in the middle of the winter and perish out there. That's the normal behavior for white nose. And some of those sites now are just little graveyards. All the toothpick looking things there are bones. But we did a reassessment in 2010 so we could get a better understanding of what we were left with in the aftermath of this very, very rapid decline. So we're talking 90, 95 percent declines in some of these species within just a one to two year period. When we did that reassessment, we looked at a number of different things, not just how many bats we counted in caves and mines. We actually were looking at how many we would catch when they came to breed in the fall at those sites. So you can see looking at the little brown bat, Myotis lucificus and the northern long-eared bat, Myotis septentrionalis, as you travel down through time there and get to 2009, which is right after white nose syndrome, we're left with hardly any and such a low capture rate there. In our summer mist net surveys, we were seeing that same kind of trend. Again, the same two species, post white nose syndrome, really low. And in our acoustic surveys as well, where we listened for bats, we also saw those numbers decrease. So across the board here, this is just to show you that we used a lot of different survey methods to determine that some of these species had decreased very drastically. And that's why we made the listing decisions to add them to the state endangered species list in Vermont. But on the good news side, we saw that some of our bat species, such as the little brown bat, although they suffered a 90% population decline initially in our post white nose syndrome monitoring of these colonies living in attics and barns, they actually look to be stabilized. So over the last four years, and this is a real voluntary, uh, sorry, volunteer effort, and if Judy's in the room, she was part of this. This is people going out, and <laughs> she says, thank you. <laughs> we couldn't do it without the citizen science monitoring effort here, people counting bats as they exit buildings. So that was really good news. These are just different towns that have colonies in them. So I just wanted to show you a little bit about human disturbance. So in some cases, 
we've put up um, gates. And so here you can see what happens with a population at one of these sites where bats hibernate. When we look at the total population when a bat-friendly gate is put up that prevents people from going in and disturbing bats in the winter. You can see that that population increased until white-nose syndrome hit. And then you can see the same thing at this other cave in Windsor County. A gate was installed and the land was donated to the Nature Conservancy and again that population increased. So what I wanted to just point out here was that sometimes our surveys miss things. So we had northern long-eared bats historically in the site that died out after white-nose syndrome, but they can be very hard to detect. And in fact, we went in last year and found a, a dead bat of the species on the floor there. So we hope that at least they're persisting. So this is the thought that I wanted to leave you with, those ecosystem implications and if there are ways that we can collaborate through the monitoring cooperative to find some of the answers to these questions, that would be excellent. Thank you so much.